You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. The scripture passage for today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 23, verses 10 through 13. For six years you should plant crops on your land and gather in its produce. But in the seventh year you should leave it alone and undisturbed so that the poor among your people may eat. What they leave behind, the wild animals may eat. You should do the same with your vineyard and your olive trees. Do your work in six days, but on the seventh day you should rest, so that your ox and donkey may rest, and even the child of your female slave and the immigrant may be refreshed. Be careful to obey everything that I have said to you. Don't call on the names of other gods. Don't even mention them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, welcome back for what is week three in our summer sermon series entitled God in the Wild. If this is your first time here with us today or the first time tuning in uh, for this conversation, welcome. For the last couple weeks and for the next several ahead of us, we are taking our spirituality outside. We are asking the question, what might nature, what might creation have to teach us about the heart of God? the character of God, the personality of God? And furthermore, what might nature and creation have to reveal to us about what it means to call ourselves followers of Jesus and the life this Jesus wants for us? And so if this is your first time here today or tuning in for the first time, uh, so far we've investigated trees, coral reefs, all of the weeds that have infiltrated my front yard. But today... I want to ask a different question. Each week, we're asking a question like this. What do cicadas, dirt, and my beloved cat, Kitty, have to reveal to us about the nature of God? What do these three things have to reveal to us about the Christian life? Let's dig in. If you have your Bibles uh, and you want to return back to our passage for today, go ahead and flip right back to Exodus chapter 23. If you're watching this online, feel free to hit pause and locate a Bible so you can follow along with us. Before we get into the content of what we just heard read a couple moments ago, I want to make sure every one of us understands a little bit of the context in which this scripture passage is taking place. So in terms of the biblical timeline, in terms of the biblical timeline, here's where we are. The Israelites have been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. And so they have recently been liberated. Moses, the Exodus moment with Pharaoh, all of the stories you remember from Sunday school, this is the first bullet point you see there. This has just happened. And yet, we're not yet into the promised land. God said, and God promised all along, I'm going to not only liberate you, but I'm going to lead you to a new land, a new home that I've prepared for you. We're not there yet. Where we are, is in this in-between period. We're in what's known as the wilderness period. These 40 years where God's people are wandering around in the wilderness, the desert, finally trying to reach this land that God promised to them. And so what God does is God uses this as a very, very important opportunity. God uses these 40 years, I like to say, as an opportunity to hit the reset button. Think about it. If God's children, God's people, have been living not only under Egyptian bondage, but Egyptian influence for 400 years, 
God needed an opportunity to sort of redefine the relationship and reframe the way in which they understood not only God, but the type of life that this God wanted for them. And when we get to chapter 23, we see one such example of this. One of the places in chapter 23 that it appears God wants to reset and reframe in the hearts and the minds of his people is their relationship with work. Their obsession with being busy. One place where God appears to want to hit the reset button is their relationship with rest. Now, to defend them a little bit, it's important they will remember that part of their struggle to rest was thrust upon them. They, for 400 years, were forced to work, forced to be busy, forced to answer the demands of someone else. And yet, I also think there is something inherently human about this struggle. I think there is something inherently human about our inability, or maybe more honest, our unwillingness to be still. And so, God's first prescription for this illness comes in verses 10 and 11. God says this. So the first thing, the first new sort of practice and medicine I have for you is this. For six years, you should plant crops on your land and gather in its produce. But in the seventh year, you should leave it alone. I know the translation says you are to let the land lie fallow. Leave it alone, undisturbed, so that the poor among you may eat. What they leave behind, the animals may eat. And you should do the same with your vineyard and your olive trees. And I want you to pay attention to one really, really important thing here. Pay attention to the words, so that. What's very obvious here in this moment is God teaching his people how important it is not only for their own, not, not only is it important for rest for their own sake, but for the sake of others, for the sake of creation around them. Did you catch that? It reminds me of this TED Talk I listened to a couple of years ago, TED Talk uh, given by uh, Ricardo Semler, who is a Brazilian CEO. He gave a TED Talk called Running a Company with Almost No Rules. But what's fascinating are the rules he has implemented. For again, this Fortune 500 company, it's a very successful company. One of the rules that he has for his employees is that when you finish your work each week, you are not allowed to work ahead. You have to go home. Why? That makes almost no sense in this Western world in which we inhabit. It's because he found, rightly so, that so often when you finish all of your work and you work ahead, what happens? You end up creating and generating more work for your teammates, for the, your direct reports and all the people who rely upon you, depend upon you, work alongside you, whose work maybe just took a little bit longer for them that week. In essence, he said, we are not going to run after so much success and ambition if it comes at the expense of one another. He's implementing the very thing that God's trying to instill in God's people, which is this, this sort of fundamental realization that rest is not just for your sake, but it is for the sake of others as well. It's needed not just for you, but for the people around you. But God keeps going. In verse 12, uh, God says this, not only do I want you to observe this on an annual basis, on a, on a yearly, uh, every seven-year basis, I want this to also be a rhythm that sort of infiltrates your weekly rhythm. I want you to do your work for six days, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, and God would have just w installed uh, the Sabbath uh, three chapters earlier in Exodus chapter 20. On the seventh day, rest, so that your ox and donkey may rest, even the child of your female servant, and the immigrant may be refreshed. Now what God's doing is he's teaching them that this is actually the way in which creation was always designed to operate. This was always the rhythm we were supposed to abide by, not only on a yearly basis, but on a weekly basis. This is giving echoes to how the whole story started in the first place. God works, God creates for six days. And what does God do on the seventh day? God himself takes a break. 
And so by reminding them of this, by instituting this new rhythm for his people, what God is doing is God is also making another really important statement that rest, friends, is not only good for you, it's not only healthy, it's faithful. It's obedient, one might say. It's one of the many ways we demonstrate a trust not only in God, but the way in which God designed us to be. And once again, this is the whole conversation we're having all summer long. This gospel truth we find not only located in scripture, but we find it all over creation. One such example that's actually on all of our minds was the recent invasion of cicadas that came our way last month. By now, by way of the news or social media, or maybe your children did a report on this and brought home every single fact about cicadas you could ever think of, which was my daughter, you've learned, you've learned that last month, why all of us were living very uncomfortably and having these bugs land in our hair, land on our food, uh, is because there are two types, two breeds of cicadas, the annual cicada and the periodical cicada, that emerged from the ground at the same time. It was a really rare event. Uh, and they did so to live a wild life for just a couple of weeks before they all died. And so it was also a really morbid sort of experience for all of us. Did any uh, young parents, by the way, have any trouble explaining to your children uh, what these bugs were doing during those two weeks, uh, that two week period? We just went with, uh, they were making friends. Uh, they were making friends. They came out of the ground to find friends, find community. That's what they were doing. But. We learned, right, we all learned that these two types of cicadas, the annual cicada, go to the next picture, Ken, they, lived on, they live underground for most of their life. Annual cicadas live under the ground for two to five years, and then they emerge and live for a couple weeks. The periodical cicada lives underground between 13 and 17 years before it emerges from the ground. In other words, these bugs understand how important it is that they rest they fuel up, they charge up for the wild two weeks of love, friend making, friend making uh, that they're going to participate in. Speaking of dirt, speaking of soil, speaking of the underground, did you know that soil itself also needs rest? One of the interesting things about this passage for today is that oftentimes I think we think of the land. Uh, as just sort of an animate object. We think of it as its, its existence is just there. But what's so fascinating is that in this story, in this passage, God gives the land agency. Put simply, God makes the land a character in the story. You, human beings, need to give it rest. Give her rest. And scientifically, this is backed. This is not just a spiritual lesson. This is an ecological lesson. Scientists after scientists have taught us this. And some of you know this firsthand because you plant crops or you have gardens. You know this, that you have to let soil rest. Why? Because if you don't, if you overwork it, the nutrients get depleted, it begins to degrade, and it erodes. Put simply, it dies. Put even more simply, we kill it. If it's going to fulfill its divine purpose, it must rest. And I'll give you one more example. One more that maybe you have inside your own home as well. Maybe for you, the most inspiring example of this this morning will be my beloved cat, Kitty. Now, my cat, for not only a living, for her entire existence, does this. She sleeps all day. And I'm, so I didn't grow up with cats. Some of you grew up with cats, and so you understand this fact. Like, you think this is totally fine. I grew up with dogs, and so I'm, like, legit concerned after the first several weeks of this. I'm like, homegirl is sleeping for 15 to 20 hours a day. Something is wrong. She has an illness. There's something going on. And then you study this. You study, uh, and you begin to realize uh, that originally, Cats are predators, and so their predatory nature actually necessitated them to sleep long portions of the day so they had enough energy for the hunt. One study found that a hunting session for a cat is like the equivalent of a human being doing a high interval intensity workout, a HIIT workout. It requires a ton 
ton of energy on their behalf. And so they're storing up for that. But our cat doesn't have to actually go out and hunt for her food and her survival. And so apparently she stores it all up so she can keep us awake from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. every single evening, running around our house chasing imaginary creatures. The point is this. Once again, the gospel truth we find not only here in our scripture passage for today, but everywhere all over creation, is that every single organism, every single living and breathing thing needs rest. And increasingly, what's concerning to me is it appears that the only organism that didn't get that message is us. Increasingly, it feels like we're the only group out there that says, you know, well, well we're evolved creatures, and we're, you know, we're, we're more abled creatures, and so maybe the first rationale that we as human beings suffer from is we go, we uh, uh, sort of have fallen into the illusion of believing, you know, we don't need rest. That's fine for the rest of creation. That's, rest for all, that's fine for all those creatures you just listed. That's fine for other people even. But we don't need as much or any, if that matters. Some of us fall into one of these statistics. A couple of years ago, U.S. Travel Association found that uh, in Ameri the American workers, uh, 768 million vacation days went unused. And the reason for this is because on an annual by annual basis, 44% of American workers do not take all of their vacation. Now, check out what this results in. When we don't do that, it's almost like a direct line. 49% of American workers feel significant stress related to work and overwork. And currently, right now, at this given moment, 67% of American workers describe themselves as burnt out on at least an occasional basis. But yeah, 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 tell me how much you don't need rest, right? Maybe for you, uh, that's actually not your struggle. Maybe you, uh, for a while now, you've known you needed rest, and you're at the, the core of your being. It's, that's not the problem. You know you need it. You want it. But maybe for you, the deeper issue, the harder issue to admit is that when it comes to rest, you're scared to take it. You're scared to make space for it. One of the regular conversations I will have with people in my office or grabbing coffee, one of the rationale folks will give as to why they are so busy and why they don't make more space for rest restoration and rejuvenation is because they're so scared of admitting this to someone. If you work inside the home, some of you, you're, you're terrified to admit this to your partner. Terrified to admit that you're, you love these children, but sweet Jesus, you need a break from these children and all of the housework that you're doing week in and week out, day in and day out. And so you battle all of the mom or dad guilt that comes with that. And you battle all of the, all of the shame and feeling like a failure to love and to be everything your family needs you to be. Or maybe for you, it's with your employer. It's with your supervisor. You're terrified to admit this reality to your supervisor. You're terrified because you don't want to be lumped in as someone who doesn't care or someone who can't cut it or someone who isn't passionate about the work you're all involved in. And so today, I'm, I'm really passionate about this. I don't want to just point out the problem. I want to help. I want to help. Some of you... You're so scared to have this conversation. You want to, but you don't know how. And I want to give you some tools to have that conversation. Here's a couple of really important pieces of information to know. Let's say this is a conversation with an employer, with an organization that you work for. One of the things that you have to understand is that they have a vested interest in your well-being. Last year, U.S. employers spent 300 with a B billion dollars trying to solve issues related to overworking their employees. That's a B, $300 billion, hiring new people, absenteeism, all the things that go along with overworking your employees. 
And a Stanford study also found that when they studied human beings, there is a limit to our productivity. As much as we like to think we can work all week long, the Stanford study found that when human beings work up to 50, if they work more than 50 hours, their productivity tanks. And if they work beyond 55 hours, it evaporates. Put simply, human beings are not designed to work that much for that long. As much as you think you're special, if you're human, which I think is most people in uh, this room, this is true of you. And so, I wanna, again, I want to be helpful. Armed with those statistics, I want to encourage you, maybe, maybe, it's having a conversation with your employer and saying, and starting out like this. What if I said, boss name, I had a way to save you money and make myself more productive? Any sane boss would answer, yes, please say more. And if they say no to that, maybe that ain't the place for you. Or again, maybe you're having this conversation with your partner in your side, your own home. Go to your uh, partner and say, what if I had uh, something and I had an idea that would boost my mood, allow me to show up uh, better for my kids, and maybe even increase intimacy more in our relationship? Would you be interested in something like that? You better believe every single one of them partners is going to be like, good Lord, sign me up. What's going on? How are we doing that? The point is this. Part of the obstacle is helping people other understand that everyone wins when you take care of yourself. That's just facts. Everyone wins when you make space for you. Now, maybe I haven't hit you yet. Maybe you're still waiting because you're like, no, that's, that's not my struggle either. Like, I'm not... It's not that I don't think I don't need it. I know I need it. It's not that I'm afraid to talk to anybody about it. That's not it either. Maybe for you, it's even deeper still. Maybe for you, it's there's an internal battle that you're just so afraid of being still. You're so afraid of the thoughts that come in when you are still. The issues that you are now being confronted with now that you are still long enough to hear them or to see them. Maybe for you, let's just be real, maybe some of you, you are the single income earner in your home. You're a single mom, you're a single dad, and so your family is relying upon you overworking in order to keep everything in the air. Maybe that's, you, you're terrified of the thought of, good Lord, what would happen and how would we be provided for if I don't continue to bust my tail all the time? Or maybe for you, work has become your addiction. And I don't use that word lightly. Maybe busyness and overwork and overstimulation has become this new thing, this new strategy you use to escape and avoid the things inside or outside that you dare not address. Now, I can kind of feel a little bit of the air in the room at the current moment. Whenever you preach sermons like this, particularly to a crowd like this that suffers from being busy all of the time, I know, because I've sat in these sermons before, how almost natural it is to now have these feelings bubbling up of guilt and shame. And you're sitting there, well, gosh, now I not only don't work, uh, I work too much, but I'm letting myself down. Now Kyle's saying I let other people down. And dear God, we're having this conversation in church. Now you're saying I let God down. And so I'm actually going to flip it, and I'm going to encourage you today. That at no point in this conversation does God have any interest in making any of us feel shame or guilt. To go back to our passage for today, the only thing that God is interested in is your and my liberation. That's it. And so I want to encourage you today that if that's where you find yourself, you find yourself in this place that oftentimes this journey just sort of mirrors our, our salvific journey. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's a step-by-step -step 
journey. So go and put that graphic up there, Ken. Maybe for you, as you come into this conversation, you're at the bottom of this stair uh, case. You're at the bottom of this, and you, for you, you take zero hours of rest per week. And so if that's you, then I like to have this conversation kind of like in the same way I have the generosity conversation. Sometimes when we have a, a conversation on generosity, folks, I'll say to folks, listen, your, your journey in generosity is the same thing with Jesus. It's taking step by step, taking the next step in your growth. And so if currently you're doing zero hours, you're, give, you're scheduling and budgeting zero hours of rest per week, maybe for you, faithfulness looks like moving to two to four. Or maybe you've been doing the bare minimum, and so now it's, you, but your body is telling on you, and it's saying you need more, and so it's moving up to four to eight. Or maybe it's four to eight to eight to 12. What I'm trying to help you see is that this is the pathway to liberation that God so often invites us into. Sometimes it's overnight, and sometimes it's a long, step-by-step -step path of obedience. Now, I want to address something also with this that I think is very, very important. Another obstacle that will happen for so many of us is maybe for you, you can see this and that's, you're like, great, okay, I can do this, I can budget it, I can find a day on my calendar and I can schedule, I can literally block it out on my calendar so that I have it to rest. But what do I do, right? This is so often the conversation in church. So often in church, we do a really, really good job of talking about rest and the importance of stopping working, but we never actually address the second half of the equation, right? And for some of you, you're like, yes. Oftentimes, I feel like it's a very narrow definition of rest I've ever been given. That rest, according to the Bible, uh, it, uh, is just doing nothing. It's just sort of like laying like this for 24 hours, and that's really, that, that's torture is what that is, uh, quite frankly, for me. Uh, and so I want to encourage you that this is actually a two-part, two, there's two halves to the equation. In order to truly rest, friends, you have to do two things. You have to actually unplug from something and you have to plug into something else. So often in church, we fail this conversation because we only do the first half. We say, you gotta rest, you gotta stop. But we don't fill in the second half of the equation, which is rest is not only stopping, but it's starting something in its place. And so maybe for you it is starting a Netflix binge-a-thon where you're horizontal for hours on end. Maybe that is for you, but maybe that's not restful for you. Maybe what's restful for you is a book, or a podcast, or a walk, or exercise, or getting lunch with a friend. You need to ask yourself the hard question of not just what do I need to stop doing, that's the easier part. The harder part is what are the things in my life that make me feel whole again? According to Exodus, friends, rest is this. Rest is anything, anything that allows the Holy Spirit to restore, recenter, and reconcile you with God, or maybe it's with yourself, or maybe it's with the beloved creation all around us. I'll leave you with this. If you don't know this about me, I am a really big tennis fan. Well, I should say I'm struggling a little bit because I was a big tennis fan when Roger Federer played, but then he retired, and how dare he take rest, dadgummit. And so I find myself in this current place where I'm searching for my, new, my next new favorite player. And I'll tell you, one player that is fastly moving up the list is Naomi Osaka. I love the way she plays, but more importantly, I love the person she is. And you might know this name, because a couple of years ago, Naomi Osaka was uh, killing it. She was beating everybody and doing it with ease. But she met headlines because at the height of her powers, at the height of her early success, she decided to take months off of professional tennis because she realized that she was not only neglecting her personal health, her physical health, but her mental health as well. And I'm just gonna say it this way. 
It takes a crap load of guts to do something like that. To stare down all the commentators, to stare down all the money that you stand to lose, all in the name of loving yourself, loving the person God made you to be too much to live in bondage to those forces. Now, it may not be as public. It may not be, the stakes may not be as high as hers. But I do think that every single one of us in this room, at some point in your life, at some point in your life, you're going to have to make that same decision. At some point in your life, you are going to have to make the decision of what do you actually want out of this life? Do you want the validation and the approval and the success and the peacekeeping uh, with other people that comes with living an overstimulated, overscheduled, overcrowded, crushing existence? Or would you rather have the peaceful, quiet satisfaction of living a restful, balanced, faithful life? And as your pastor, I hope, I pray, you choose the latter. Thank you for listening to The Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.